So we have a very full agenda today and a lot of information. So I'm actually gonna start at the top of the hour here. For those of you that have, I've not met, because I think we have people coming and joining us from across the country today. My name is Jennifer Pliner, and I work in outreach at JDRF at the Greater Bay Area Chapter in San Francisco. And I became involved with JDRF about uh, three years ago. My son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And um, for those of you that are unaware of JDRF, we are the leading global organization funding type 1 diabetes research. And we focus on life uh, accelerating or life-changing breakthroughs in three different areas uh, or three buckets as I see it. One is curing type 1, preventing type 1, and treating type 1 diabetes and its complications. We also offer personalized support and educational resources and opportunities to get together with others in the community, now virtually. Uh, and I'd like to just go over a few uh, housekeeping items before we begin today. First, this session is being recorded. Secondly, if you guys can just make sure to turn your, uh, keep yourself on mute and turn your videos off during the presentation portion of the event just to reduce background noise. There is going to be, I don't know how familiar everyone is with Zoom, but if you hover on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat icon and you are welcome to post or write in questions into the chat icon. And we can get to those questions during the Q&A portion of our session. Um, also, during the Q&A portion of our session, you can, uh, if you want to ask a question, you can put in your first name and your last initial and we'll announce it and you guys can just pop off of mute and put your video on the screen and ask Dr. D a question directly. So uh, now I'd like to introduce you to Bethany Chung, who is our sponsor today from Xeris Pharmaceuticals. And Xeris is the maker of Givoke, which is the first and only liquid stable glucagon that is mixed, pre-mixed pre-filled and pre-measured, making it easy to use anytime. So Bethany. Thank you so much. I am going to just talk for a few minutes because I know everybody's here to see Dr. Adi, um, but I'm just going to talk about the severe hypoglycemia landscape. Severe hypoglycemia persists among people um, with type 1 diabetes despite improvements in technology. Um, CGM and insulin pumps can help reduce, but not eliminate, severe hypoglycemic events. Severe hypogly hypoglycemic events occur at all levels and all glycemic control of all ages. So in the chart, you have the A1C and then the different age groups. Uh, the, severe of, the risk of severe hypoglycemia increases with age. And there's different guidelines that are set forth by the American Diabetes Association and the International Hypoglycemia Study Group. And I'm really excited to introduce for the first time, it won't be available till tomorrow, um, but since we were doing this meeting today, it just seemed fitting. Um, I'm going to introduce the GVOC HypoPen. It is the first um, HypoPen for treatment of severe hypoglycemia in adults and pediatric patients um, two and above. A short video for you. Evoke Hypopen for severe low blood sugar is easy to use. It's a good idea for you and the people in your life to know how to use it before you need it. Pull the red cap off. Push the yellow end on bare skin for five seconds. The window will turn red to let you know when you're done. Simple. Next generation of GVOC, um, the pre-filled syringe was the first offering of Xeris, and this will be available tomorrow, proven to work. And through the end of July, Xeris will be offering $0 copay for commercial eligibly, eligible patients. Um, even if your insurance doesn't cover it, Xeris will pay down the total amount for at least two of the hypopens. Thank you for letting me take this time, and thanks, Dr. D. Bethany, thank you so much for, for letting us know about the, the great progress that GVOC is making to help our, ourselves and our loved ones. Um, now I'm going to introduce you to Dr. D and go ahead, Dr. D, you can get your slides onto the screen. Um, so Dr. D has a long introduction here, so I'm going to read this. He is 
a retired professor of pediatrics and founding director at UCSF Madison Clinic for Pediatrics. He's also the co-founder and chief medical advisor at Tidepool.org. And uh, we are fortunate enough to have him as a greater, JDRF Greater Bay Area board member. So Dr. D, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Jen. Uh, before I start, I want to thank uh, Bethany for making this introduction. This is an exciting development in the world of diabetes and uh, letting us know about it one day ahead. I do have to say that the video actually didn't show. Uh, I didn't see the video on my screen. And I wonder how many other participants could not see it on their screen. So Bethany, if you have, the, if you have a link to the video where it's available online, uh, that you can post it on, uh, on the chat so that everybody can see it and maybe they can just view the video online instead of uh, here. Um, all right, so uh, thank you all for being here, for joining us today. I'm really excited about this and, and the grateful for JDRF to offer this opportunity for me to present uh, at, uh, on this topic, which is very dear to my heart, how to interpret your CGM data. So uh, we have a lot to talk about. Let's dive right in. Um, and I'm going to, you know, zoom through my slides. There are a lot of uh, slides to go through, uh, no pun intended. So our objective today is um, to provide you some general tips on retrospective review of CGM data, uh, review the basics of basal rates and optimization of basal rates, and, and tell you why I believe that's one of the most important things in terms of adjusting insulin regimens. Uh, and then review some tips on calculating insulin to carb ratios in ISF and provide some example cases. And not to forget, what about closed loops? Uh, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, adjusting all of these things, including the basal rates and optimization of the settings. Uh, and some people will say, well, well, how is that important since we are in, living in the world of closed loop systems and automated insulin delivery? We, don't, we, we may not need to optimize everything. The system will just take care of it. And hopefully I will provide you some evidence why we do need to optimize the settings because having optimized settings um, uh, will, will help improve the, the efficiency of closed loop systems. Uh, just to start with some general comments, data review and adjustments every two, four, four weeks, at least in ch children. Uh, in adults, this may not be necessarily true that once you get to a stable insulin regimen, you might be okay for a few years, in fact, maybe even for longer. But for children, that's never the case. Uh, and I noticed that in the list of attendees today, there are lots of people with children with type 1 diabetes. Uh, and I would argue that adjusting insulin and review of the data should be done routinely um, every two to four weeks, at least uh, every four weeks or so but not wait until three months for, for your visit with your doctor or your nurse uh, so that uh, to review the data, it should be done much earlier than that. Uh, it's best to review the CGM data and the pump data, although uh, there are certainly some values for reviewing just CGM data if there are no pump data, but that's only useful if there are some very clear trends and some unusual circumstances where you can really see what's going on just looking at the CGM data, but most of the times it would be most helpful to have the pump and the CGM data together and including some other contextual data like the activity and sports uh, that, and, and the food, the type of food that we're eating, obviously. But that's, we can't do that all on the screen and collect it automatically or electronically. Uh, that will require some uh, you know, in-person conversations, which can be done either in person or in telemedicine. I think, you know, with the recent developments and the way we've been living for the last four or five months, uh, you know, telemedicine has taken a, a front seat and we have been using telemedicine uh, to review the data together with sharing screens with the parents and spending some quality time on, online and reviewing the data together. Adjusting insulin is more than art than science. I think this is something that we've been hearing uh, since I started doing diabetes and learning about diabetes, that uh, it's, it's really more of an art than science. But I'm going, I'm going to challenge that today and hopefully convince you that actually has become more of, an, of a science than art because there is a science to it. And I think, you know, the old adage that it's art, more art than science is probably an old one that no longer applies. So when we talk about insulin regimen settings, uh, you know, we're really talking about some 
basic elements, just to simplify it and put it on paper. It's really the main three things, basal insulin, insulin to carb ratio, and ISF. If we think about it in those simple terms, those are the basic elements uh, that we can you know, work on them one by one and get them to be optimized as much as possible. The fourth one is insulin duration time, which is something that was introduced with the use of pumps because when they started calculating the insulin duration time and calculating insulin on board, it started affecting how people think about dosing insulin. But particularly in uh, closed loop systems, this has become actually an important element because closed loops will also take into, a into factoring in how much insulin on board is still there and then subtracting that or calculating into the dosing that the closed loops are, uh, algorithm are calculating and, and giving. Uh, and then finally, and I put this in gray, you know, extended bolus and adjustments for exercise are clearly something that we need to talk about. They're not necessarily pump settings, uh, but they're settings that you know, we, parameters that we play with and we need to optimize them. And the reason I put this in gray, because I don't think that we have time to go over that, but maybe we have some time for the last element, which is what I call a low treatment index, uh, meaning how many grams of carbohydrates do you really need to treat low blood sugar? And then we have maybe a couple of examples that we can go over. This is something that could, should also be calculated and it's extremely helpful in minimizing the the swings of blood sugar up and down and making sure that we're treating hypoglycemia adequately. Basal insulin uh, is something that I always start with. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's the most important one. Uh, and you know, the simplest definition of it is the minimum amount of insulin that you need, even if you don't eat anything. So why focus on basal rates? Uh, I do focus on it because it makes up about a quarter to half of the total daily insulin. It occupies about one third to one half of the day running on just basal insulin with no other boluses during sleep time. And that can be again between eight and 12 hours each day. So basically it's winning. If we optimize the basal settings by themselves with not, nothing else, we're winning half the battle. That's half the day on just running on basal and half the total daily insulin is only basal. So that's half the battle if we can get the basal rate to be just right. And more importantly, it, again, for closed loop systems that are being developed and being used today, the, the basal actually makes up the basis for many of those systems, meaning that it takes whatever basal rate that's running at the time and just modulates it up and down by using a temporary basal uh, according to the CGM tracing and the direction and the prediction of the blood glucose. So it's really important to have a good base for those systems to work more efficiently. If we have a good base and a nicely tuned basal rates, then I think we're gonna get better performance of closed loops. Meaning that if the algorithm does not have to widely swing the, the, the basal rate up and down. So let's say for example, if you don't have a good basal setting, uh, it may, the, the closed loop system may actually need to, you know, double or triple the basal rate uh, be, so to achieve a good result or that it, it may have to shut it off completely for several hours if it's too high of a basal rate to begin with. So having a fine-tuned basal rate, I think will you know, improve the performance of closed loop systems because they only have to make adjustments occasionally and they only have to make small adjustments, not big adjustments like doubling or tripling the basal. Um, and Having an optimized basal rate uh, also provides a safe fallback when loops open. Closed loop systems don't, don't stay closed all the time. They're going to open every once in a while because of either loss of connectivity or you know, the, the, the sensor falls out in the middle of the night. And we need to have a fallback so that when we go back to manual pump settings, it's going to be okay and it's going to be keep the child or the person with diabetes in a good range and not cause any hypoglycemia or more importantly, hyperglycemia in the middle of the night because the basal rate was set too low. Uh, much easier to work on insulin to carb ratio and ISF if the basal rates is well tuned. If we don't have a good basal rate, then we really don't know why the boluses are not working. Is it not enough insulin for the carbs? Is it not enough basal or is it both? And the same thing for correction boluses as well. Uh, so having a good background basal settings that we know it's kind of working okay, or at least it's adequate, then we can probably isolate the effect of the bolus for the carbs and the bolus for the correction of high blood sugar 
and evaluate whether it's enough or too much or just right. And then here's a tip. I always start with a nighttime basal rate uh, when we start in the beginning. So I start with the basal adjustments and with the basal, I start always at night to look at it. Let's remember a few facts about basal rates. Uh, they are very variable. Uh, so the same basal rate is not this, you know, it's not one basal rate all day. Uh, it's different at 6 a.m. versus 3 p.m. versus 10 p.m. versus 3 a.m. Uh, so every single day, every hour, every period of the day, we have a different basal rate. Basal rates change constantly throughout childhood. Just because we get them right doesn't mean that they're going to stay with you and be effective for all the time. As children grow and adjust and, 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 and develop uh, and hitting puberty and hormones, etc., the basal rates are going to change. The patterns are going to change. The, the amount of insulin that's delivered is going to change. So we have to keep adjusting that. Again, in adults, this may not be the case, but in children, it's extremely important to keep at it and keep adjusting it. It is a highly individualized and vary from day to day. Even in the same person, basal rates may not be exactly the same. That sounds like a you know, daunting you know, issue here, but uh, I think that there are some patterns uh, that will make this you know, a lot easier. So let's, let's begin to look at some of these patterns uh, that we need to keep in mind. This is a study that was done by the data scientist at Tidepool, uh, which is the organization that I work with now. And, and it makes you know, software that allows the use uh, and, and the aggregation of data from pumps and CGMs and visualization of that data. And basically through the data donation project that people who upload their data to Tidepool and donate their data for research anonymously, uh, they went in and, and collected a ton of data. These are thousands and thousands of patient days with lots of data. And they looked at the median basal rate for different age groups. Uh, basically, this is just to give us a ballpark of what the basal rate should be. It's easy to look at the basal rate for someone at a different age and say, am I in the ballpark or is my basal rate you know, too low or too high? And it turns out that for most adults and, and, and young adults and older adults, uh, the basal rate usually runs about 0.8 to 0.9 unit an hour. Uh, so here you can see for age group for 21 to 24, for example, it's 0.9 unit an hour. For most, you know, 25 to 29 year old, it's 0.9 unit an hour. And it's like, decrease a little bit as we get older, you know, uh, people with type one diabetes has been living long enough to see that, you know, reach an age of 70 and then the basal rate actually starts to decrease, you know, between 60 and 70, it's 0.75 and then even less than that 0.55. That's, that's not just the basal rate decreasing, but the total daily insulin requirement decreases as well. Uh, but on the other end, we can see here, this is very important to see that the basal rate, uh, you know, average or median basal rate for children starts out being at 0.2 unit an hour. And in fact, if we break this down into even the one and two year old group and the three to five year old, uh, we just didn't have enough patients in each group to divide them. That's why they were lumped. But if we did break them down, we will see that a two-year-old will be on the order of 0.05 to 0.1 unit an hour, while the one to five or the three to five would be a 0.2 and gradually increases until it hits the peak at the peak puberty at the age of 15 to 17, hitting about one unit an hour. So if someone comes in who is, let's say a three-year-old and has a basal rate of 0.5 unit an hour, that clearly right there is a red flag and you say, that's just way too much. So these are just guidelines to give you a ballpark where your basal rate should be, at least during the daytime. And again, we're gonna see that it varies tremendously between nighttime and daytime. And the next slide will show just the variability. This is the same data was the same, you know, in the square, in the blue squares here, but just to show you the variability between person to person and how it can be quite variable. Let's take, for example, the 15 to 17 year old, we said it's about one unit an hour, but some people are on the order of 0.5 to 0.6, and some people go up to even 1.75 and 1.8 unit an hour. So there's clearly a lot of variability between a person and another. And here, this is a different, uh, the, a different view of the same data almost, but showing it in terms of the, the, the percent basal insulin compared to the total daily insulin. And generally, if you ask most people, they say, what's your 
what should the percent of your basal be? And it should be about half of my total daily insulin. That turned out to be correct. Most people are actually on about 50% basal insulin and they stay on it. Most adults stay on it throughout their life. Uh, so here again, are reflecting of those, you know, older than 70 years old being, you know, requiring less basal rate, but it's, it's actually because the total daily insulin decreases and still half of it is basal rate and half of it is boluses. But again, going back to the childhood area here, right here, we will see that the percent of basal starts out much lower than that. In fact, again, if we had the column for the one to two year old infants and toddlers, we will see that it's actually closer to 20 to 25% basal. Or, you know, compared to the total daily insulin and it gradually increases with time until they hit puberty and that's when it reaches about 48 to 50 percent. So again, a ballpark that tells you whether you really need to work on your basal or you need to work on your bolus. Uh, if you have a, let's say, a, a seven-year-old with 60 uh, percent basal, that clearly suggests that uh, you know, 60% basal is just too much for this child. There's something that's unbalanced there, or even a 50%, because I think 60% is kind of easy to see that it's too much anyway for anyone. Uh, but to, to, to say that it's 50% basal for a seven-year-old, that's too much, even though most people are at 50%, but not for a seven-year-old. It should be less than that. Uh, so that's, you know, again, big picture kind of evaluation of uh, is your basal a problem or is that where we need to start? Is your carb ratio or is your ISF? Uh, but I think that's a, a good ballpark to start. And again, these are just to show the variability between, you know, uh, in, for each age group. And there's a lot of variability and one has to keep that in mind. Uh, everything is individualized. And here's one other study that was published in 2012. This is from Germany and, and Austria, looking at their database of all the patients because they actually have keep track of everyone in all of Germany and Austria, and they record everything on them. And to summarize this, I just wanna show you that, you know, again, similar age groups, zero to six years old, six to 12, 12 to 18, and adults 18 to 25. And what we see here is that depends on the time of day, this is midnight, this is 6 a.m., noon, and then midnight again, depends on the time of the day, how the basal rate sort of, you know, is relative to each, to each other. And there is a peak here in the morning around 6 a.m. And then there's a decrease and then a much higher peak here in the evening time, right after they go to sleep around 10 p.m. And this is for the zero to six years old. That peak in the morning continues in almost everyone at every age group, but then the 12, uh, sorry, the six to 12 year old, this evening peak sort of starts to decrease, come down, and it's no longer higher than the morning peak. You remember, this is the, the young children, they're much higher peak in the evening than the morning one. This is almost the same. And then as they get into puberty, the morning peak is much higher than the evening peak. And then as they get into adult, the same thing persists here. And we're going to notice that there's actually a decrease here. This is before the morning peak, there is a, a, a midnight valley here that we're gonna see a little bit clearer on the next slide. Okay, we're just gonna go through this. This is, this is sort of my way of representing that same pattern of basal rate because I think it helps me uh, assess what the basal rates should be uh, and uh, make more sense of it. So in a prepubertal child, the daily basal rate would, you know, would be something that looks like this, starting at midnight, whatever it is, and then it decreases dramatically between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. This is what I call the, the midnight valley here of you know, requiring very little insulin. In fact, it's the lowest basal rate of the day should always be somewhere around 1 to 3 a.m. Again, assuming that, a, that the person is going to sleep at a normal time and waking up at a normal time. And then at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., it starts to increase gradually until it hits the peak at 6 to 7 a.m., 8 a.m., start decreasing until you get to a point where you're kind of running the daytime basal, what I would call the daytime basal. Then the child eats dinner and goes to bed, sleeps in, and then it starts to rise again. Basal rate right here in a prepubertal child before they hit puberty, especially the younger ones. This peak right here, this is the highest basal rate of the day around 10, 11 p.m. as opposed to the lowest basal rate being between 1 and 3 a.m. 
Now, now we're going to take the 1 to 3 a.m. right here and point out that how this highest basal right here is going to turn to the lowest basal here within three to four hours, a dramatic shift in basal rate coming down here. And this requires quite a bit of attention and timing and really making adjustments every hour of the night to make sure that we're timing this correctly and, and customizing it to each child depends on what time they go to sleep, what time they eat dinner, and how old they are, and, and how close they are to sort of starting puberty or not yet. Uh, but this is kind of the general pattern here. And I'm going to show you some, some values here just to give you a sense of what the sort of relativity of these. And you can see that the, the difference between the daytime being 0.35, and then it jumps up to 0.5, and then within a few hours, coming back down to about 0.2. Two five. That's almost half. Actually, it is half. You know, from 0.5 unit an hour being cut 50% within a few hours to go to 0.25%, and then gradually increasing to about 0.4, and then back down to 0.35. And if they go to the next slide, which is the post-puberty children, as you know, we noted earlier in the slides that 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 there are two peaks, but the morning peak is now the highest one, and then the afternoon or evening peak is now a little bit less than that, and it varies quite a bit here, right here, from person to person. Uh, but the point here again to show that this evening peak, right after they go to bed, disappears after they hit puberty, uh, and now this is the highest peak. And the relativity of these basals, again, being 0.6 right here at the valley, at the lowest one, can it dramatically increase to 0.9 or even one unit an hour at 6 a.m., and then comes back down to 0.75, and then stays that way, or 0 0.7, 0 0.75, 0 0.8, 0 0.65. Somewhere in there, it depends on what they do and depends on you know, their, their daily routine as well. But generally speaking, those are the two patterns that I keep in mind, because if I know that this is generally the pattern that needs to be in a six or seven year old, I kind of, you know, get whatever basal rate that you can give me that I know it's going to work and take this particular one, for example, between 11 and noon and say, if the 11 to noon is 0.35, then what the rest of the day should look like and what this should look like, this should be much higher than that. And this should be much higher, but not as high as this one. And I could also guess what the 1 a.m. basal should be if I know that the 0.35 is working during the day. I know that the 1 a.m. should be much less than that, maybe 0.2 or 0.25. So I can start, once I have one of these values, I can start building around it and go up and down to keep this pattern in mind. And instead of just guessing completely, following this pattern will be a lot more informative. And before we leave this slide, I want to just, you know, yeah, I put this in here, 3 a.m. in orange, just to remind me to say that in my personal experience over the past several years, what I find is that whatever basal rate ends up being working really well here at night between 3 and 4 a.m., generally speaking, that gives you a pretty good guess what the basal rate during the day should be. So if this is about 0.3 to 0.35, then I think the daytime should be about 0.35. And the same thing here, if the 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. is about 0.7 to 0.8, then generally speaking, the daytime should be around the same one. So whatever basal rate is working between 3 and 4, that should work during the daytime. And because, you know, remember at the night, we can actually guess what the basal rate should be. You can work on it. We're going to see that next. But it's really much harder to do that during the day because there are meals and bolses and exercise and activity. So instead of doing a basal testing during the day, which is not something that I do anymore, uh, is you know fast all day. Let's see what your basal rate should be. I can pretty much guess if we figure out what the nighttime is, we can guess what the daytime should be. So before I start looking at someone's CGM data. If it's a patient that I know, then obviously I know how old they are and I know what time they were diagnosed. But if I don't, I, it's important to remember how old the child is, how long they've been diagnosed, they've had type one diabetes because you don't want somebody in, in honeymoon. That's a whole different story in looking at their CGM data and their insulin regimens and basal rates. Uh, and uh, we need to know what the total daily insulin dose is because that's gonna give us a ballpark of what the percent basal should be 
uh, and what the total basal should be based on their total daily insulin. And obviously, pubertal status, as we pointed out, it's much different in a prepubertal versus postpubertal child or someone who is in puberty in a peak puberty at age 15 or, or 16. And then it's important to know the bedtime and the wake time. You know, those peaks, the timing of those peaks in the valleys, like I said, you know, the valley being between 1 and 3 a.m., that's not a magical time about 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. It's actually related to what time you go to bed. So if it's a child who goes to bed at 8 o'clock, the peak is going to be between 10 and 11, and then it drops down to the valley at 1 to 3. If a child doesn't go to bed until 11 o'clock and doesn't wake up till 11 in the morning, that's a whole different story. The pattern remains the same, but it needs to be shifted to the right for the same number of hours that's delaying the sleep and wake up. So if they go to bed at 11 instead of 8, then we're going to shift that entire pattern by three hours moving to the right. Dr. Adi, I'm just going to give you your 30 minute, uh, okay. you're at 1230. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Um, and again, remember the patterns. They are very, very helpful. Uh, this is some guidelines for SAP, meaning sensor augmented pump users. So those who are not on uh, a closed loop system, just a pump and a CGM. Uh, evaluate the basal to bolus ratio. I'm going to go through these quickly because I think we already sort of discussed them. You know, uh, start with the nighttime. Uh, remember the patterns always. So let's start with you know, this example. And I'm gonna just spend 15 seconds on this one to orient you. This is the tight pool platform that, that gathers the information of the pump and the CGM and display it. And we, this is what we used uh, exclusively in our clinic for many years. And um, up on here, you see the time of the day and there's a midnight here. Oftentimes it's either in the middle of the screen or it starts out here at midnight and then goes up. Uh, and it's de designated by this dark shadow three hour right here, and it's every three hour. Uh, and then you see the CGM tracing here, obviously. And here below it, we'll see that the carb ratio, the, the carb bolus here, uh, and how many grams in the yellow circle, and the bolus here. And if I hover in real time, this is a screen. Uh, screenshot, but in real time, if I'm looking at the web, if I hover over this, it will actually give me the information how much was this and what kind of bolus this was. This was an extended bolus or, or, or a mixed bolus, 50% uh, upfront and 50% distributed over the next two hours. This is just a regular bolus here, a correction bolus. And it will actually tell me that this bolus was, for example, eight units based on an ISF ratio of X, and that's why it was given here at that time. Uh, so, a quick glance at this will tell us right away that here, after the last bolus and even an extended bolus, you know, three hours later, this insulin is gone now. There's no more insulin on board, but this gentleman's blood sugar is dropping all night and continuing to drop steadily all the way until he wakes up the next morning at 10 o'clock. And he only woke up because he was low and the system alarmed so that he had to treat his low blood sugar before he finally got up and, and, and did his thing. And so that clearly is, you know, with, with or without pump data, if you just have the CGN data, it will tell you that maybe the basal rate is too much and it's dropping here. And in fact, um, we go to uh, several days in a row and we see the same thing happening clearly a very established trend of blood sugar dropping here between midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, and even here, he actually woke up and, and treated his blood sugar here at 3 a.m. and got it up, and then it continued to drop back down again, and he still woke up low the next morning anyway, clearly saying that his basal rate is too much, and in fact, we go back and adjust his basal, and it works much better. Uh, just to sort of take advantage of this circle right here, this is the the one thing that, I, that I, I said we can we can have some opportunities to review, which is that the low treatment index is to identify how many grams of carbohydrates do you really need to treat your low blood sugar. Granted that in the background we have a high basal rate, so it's not super accurate, but it's a pretty good uh, place to start, which is to ask this patient, how many grams did you take to treat your low blood sugar here? And then calculate, what did it go up? It went from this level to this level. I apologize, this is in millimoles because this gentleman lives in New Zealand uh, or Australia. Uh, so, but we can calculate this. This is 10 is equivalent to 180 and four is equivalent to about 70 or 72. Uh, so from, let's say, about 60 to about 160, that's a 100-point rise. And you say, how many grams of juice did you take here, which made your blood sugar go up 100 points? And we can calculate one gram 
raises your blood sugar by how much and give some recommendations, solid recommendations to the patients, how many grams they should take when they're treating a low blood sugar so they don't overdo it and end up being too high. Obviously, this is way important in younger children, which are very sensitive to even the tiniest amount of carbohydrates. Uh, and usually, I you know I recommend that we we talk in grams. And for treating low blood sugar in 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 smaller children, you know, on the order of one gram, two grams, three grams, four grams, and figure out exactly how much you need. Um, okay, looking for trends again, just like in the other gentleman, this is a much younger child who is having a pretty good night for, for the basal rate. I mean, it's holding him nice and steady in the green zone here, right, right in range between 70 and 180. And then suddenly at 6 a.m. it starts dropping. The next day it starts dropping again. The next day it starts dropping again. So almost every day between 6 and 8 a.m. he drops his blood sugar because his basal rate is a little too much. He's still sleeping. Uh, so he's a late sleeper and his blood sugar just drops. Again, the trend is happening every day. Now, he's still in green. This is all nice and safe, but the reality is that this is a significant drop. It's 70 to 80 point drop almost every single day. And the only thing that's saving him is that he's actually starting out a little bit on the high side because his basal, his blood sugar starts to rise between five and second, five and six, and then starts to drop between six and eight. So what we need to do is to make an adjustment in his basal rate uh, between four and 6 a.m. Again, this is a point I wanna make that if, you're, if you think your blood sugar is dropping between six and, and eight, you need to adjust your basal rate between five and seven. So you go back an hour earlier because the insulin that you take at five is the one that's working at six. And that's why we need to shift back one hour. And the reason we're shifting back two hours here at four, because I think I want to give him a little bit more insulin here and a little bit less insulin there. Fine tuning things, but I think that's how we kind of get to a straight line for the whole night. And this can be done. This actually can be fun even. Um, all right, here's another patient that again, we see a very similar trend between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Blood sugar is dropping, blood sugar is dropping, blood sugar is dropping. And it's consistent every single day. There's three, literally three days in a row, June 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Uh, so again, we look at the basal rate. This actually happened to be a patient on closed loop system. This is the DIY loop. Uh, and it shows that the blood sugar is rising here. So it's actually increasing the basal here. These are all temp basals going up and it starts to decrease here. And I can hover over this and it will tell me what the basal rate is. And I can say, I need to decrease this basal rate right here. So when we decrease it again, it's dropping between three and five or 6 a.m. We gotta decrease the basal between two and five a.m. We gotta go back one hour and then adjust the basal rate. And here again, another example of treating a low blood sugar before breakfast. And we do the same exercise that we did and say, okay, how many grams did you take? Let's blow it up a little bit here. How many grams did you take? And let's calculate it. It actually went up um, from 68 to about 170 at the peak within about 30 minutes. So that's clearly the effect of the juice or the carbs or whatever it was. It turned out that this was actually one glucose tablets of four grams that raise the blood sugar about 100 points. That means one gram raises it 25 points. And that's a very good thing to keep in mind when you're treating a low blood sugar. So the other thing I would say, well, you may not even need it. Just, just eat your breakfast because if you're low just before breakfast, to point out how quickly the blood sugar can rise here uh, in the morning when you're a little bit on the low side, you can take whatever you want to take and it will raise the blood sugar fairly quickly. And you kind of at 68, it's not too low. So forget the glucose tablets, just go ahead and eat your breakfast and it will go up fairly quickly. Then I think you're safe. All right, uh, opportunities for evaluating basal rate. You know, we talk about the nighttime and we kind of look at it, it's pure and, and there's no carbs, no exercise, nothing else to affect it. We can look at the basal rate. We can see how your CGM tracing is going and make some fine tuning of it. But during the day, it's much harder. However, if we look enough, we will find opportunities. This person, for example, here, didn't eat anything from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. Skipped lunch completely. That gives a great opportunity to look at the basal rate right here. 
because this was a nice and steady line of the CGM. That means the basal rate is working just right, right here. And if I can figure out what the basal is right here, which is 1.5 unit an hour, that gives me a good idea what the basal rate should be right here at 6 a.m. and what it should be right here at 3 a.m. Uh, or 1 a.m. And I could make an assessment of that. So clearly, it seems to be working just fine here. So 1.5 is okay for the daytime, and I can start looking at the rest of it. And to just to give you an idea, now, now this is high, this is purple, so it's above 180, it's not in target range, but it's a steady. So that means the base of it is okay. What you really needed is a, a, a bolus to correct it down. Uh, and maybe what she actually needs is more insulin for the carbs because after these two meals, she has started out with green and ended up in, in, in purple and stayed that way until she ate again and then ended up a little bit higher. And then she ate again and ended up much higher. Now she had a suspended pump here for about two hours that contributed to this high, but clearly it shows that where every time she eats, she actually ends up higher. The basal rate is okay. It's maintaining her where she is and the nighttime maintaining her where she is and the daytime is maintaining her where she is. What she really needs is more insulin for the carbohydrates. Every time she eats, she, she ends up higher. And here again, just to go back to that sort of observation, it's not a rule, it's an observation that whatever your 3 a.m. basal ends up being about what you need during the day. And here's that 3 a.m. basal is 1.4 and that's 1.5 during the day, and that seems to be working. And in fact, if you wanna be fussy about it, I would say maybe the 1.4 really should be 1.5 because look what happened. It actually drifted up a little bit. So perhaps if this was 1.5, it would have stayed nice and steady here for the night. So that observation is, I find it very helpful and I hope that you will find it helpful too. Uh, here's an example of, uh, this is an old slide from, you know, the days of Dexcom uh, studio software, where looking just at CGM data, this suggests to me that here's the blood sugar dropping at night, okay? It's dropping, dropping, dropping. There's no boluses. This is just, you know, long acting insulin person on MDI, not even on a pump. This is just taking one shot of, of glargine and then short acting insulin with a meal. Here's a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And every time after each meal, it goes way up. And then several hours later, it starts dropping down. It goes way up. And then for the next six or seven hours, it keeps coming down. And the same thing here after dinner, suggesting that the insulin to carbohydrate ratio is not enough because every time he eats, he ends up way too high. But what brings him down is not the short acting insulin. It's actually the long acting insulin that's bringing him down. Again, suggesting that it's the the total basal insulin, that's too much, and the insulin to carbohydrate ratio is not enough. So we lower the basal rate, the basal insulin, the, the glargine dose, and we end up now with a much better uh, graph for the night because it's maintaining it, it's no longer dropping him at night like he was before. And now we can see clearly that the insulin to carb ratio is not enough because every time he eats, he ends up higher, higher, higher. And what we need is to increase the insulin to carb ratio. So basal is okay and he needs more insulin for the carbs. Okay, what about people who use a closed loop system? Uh, now, as a guideline, uh, we still need to evaluate the basal to bolus ratio or the basal to total daily insulin ratio because that's going to give us a good idea of what the basal should be. But it has a whole different meaning because again, closed loop systems are adjusting the basal rate, giving you higher temp basal or lower temp basal. So we need to think about it differently. Uh, start with the nighttime, same thing, closely dissect the CGM and the basal block on the daily view. And we, I'm, I'm gonna show you what that means in a second. And then take advantage of the actual basal delivery data. Meaning that, remember, the, the closed loop system is, is doing a temp basal. So if you need more basal, it's going to do a higher temp basal. Uh, let's say between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, so I don't need to guess what the basal should be. It's actually telling me how much insulin it did deliver between four and six a.m. And if we look back at several days in a row, we will see what's the average actual delivery of insulin basal between four and six a.m. And they say, that's what your basal should be uh, instead of guessing what it is. So take the actual basal delivery from the closed loop system and use that data to guide your basal rate settings. And don't forget the parents. 
so here's one, uh, one example, needs basal adjustments and more insulin to carb ratio. Uh, the, you know, starting out at night again, even with someone with a closed loop system, and this is what you will see. Here's the dotted line is what the set basal is. And all of these peaks here, these uh, the sort of, you know, uh, uh, going up and going down are the adjustments temp basal. You can see, for example, that between 4 a.m. and 6 or 7 a.m., generally speaking, it's actually doing more than what the basal settings are. So, and, and it's doing a great job. It's actually doing it. And, and the CGM tracing remains nice and steady, all in green, and it's perfect, but it's having to do all the work here for me. And when I say that, well, if, if the system is giving you more insulin during these hours every single day, maybe I should go back and just calculate how much more basal I should set it at so that it's going to give you that as a baseline and not having to make all these adjustments almost every 15 minutes it's making an adjustment. Uh, now, on the other hand, we can look at this, and I'm sorry that we don't have the circles with the carbs here, but these are boluses for meals. This is a bolus for breakfast, this is for lunch, and this is for dinner. And what we will see again that after breakfast, it goes up, after lunch, it goes up, and after dinner, it goes up. And not only it goes up after that, but also we notice that after each bolus for each meal, the closed loop system is actually increasing your basal dramatically, giving you a ton more insulin right here and right here after lunch and right here after dinner. All of this is after, you know, combined with the bolus that ended up bringing your blood sugar down here. So clearly saying that um, the insulin to carb ratio or the bolus for the carbs is not enough because it's going up and it's requiring a lot more basal insulin delivery and then the following one to two hours to bring it down. So we need to do more insulin for carbs as well. And here's a hint at that, because if the basal is now 56% and the bolus is 44, that means it, we're not giving enough boluses. And it, this ratio should actually be reversed. It should be more like 40% basal and 60% bolus. Uh, so clearly we need to make some adjustments and increase the carb ratios a lot more than increasing the basal, because we need to get to that ratio. Um, this is a slide to remind me to show a trick about, or a tip, I should say, not a trick, a tip about calculating the insulin to carb ratio. So this person actually needs more insulin for the carbs. And the way we, we, we see this is that it starts out here. Okay, she woke up, ate a snack, sorry, ate a snack and didn't bolus for it. Ended up high came here at lunch, had 40 grams and bolus for it. And this 40 gram bolus was not just bolus for the carbs because the blood sugar was high, it was 200 something. So it included a correction bolus. And again, in real time, if I hover over this, it will give me all of that information. I can see how many, how many, how many, how many units for the carbs and how many units for the correction. So this was a total bolus for the carbs and the correction. And it ended up covering the carbs just right because three hours later, it came back down to where it started with at baseline, three hours later, which is what I think is the insulin duration time between three and four, it ended up being here. So that means even though this was a, including a correction, but the total dose was enough to cover the carbs. So even though we started out with an insulin to carb ratio of 10, so that was four units for the 40 grams, and one extra units for the correction, that was a total of five. However, now the five units was just enough to cover the 40. And I'd say 40 divided by five, that's actually eight. So that means your insulin to carb ratio is really one to eight, it's not one to 10. So we change it immediately from one to eight to one to 10. And that's how I kind of figure out what your insulin to carb ratio really should be by finding these opportunities where there is a meal and there's nothing else happening, no other snacks until three or four hours later and looking what happened to the blood sugar and calculating what did it take to keep your blood sugar from going too high or to bring your blood sugar down to where it was at baseline and say that's your insulin to carb ratio. And again, the other point of this slide is I get criticized very often for having too many basal rates and I want to point out here that we have a basal rate right here at 1 a.m. of about 0.9 unit an hour. And the peak right here is about 1.8 unit an hour uh, at, at uh, 8 a.m. 
uh, which is clearly working very well. I don't think anyone can argue with that. The, but, but the thing is, going from 0.9 to 1.8, that's doubling the basal rate. So at what point do you go between 0.9 and 1.8? You know, clearly the body doesn't just wake up and say, okay, right now I need to switch from 0.9 to 1.8. I need to double my insulin. And the answer is that this is a gradual increase that happens over time from this time of the night to this time of the morning. So as it is a gradual increase in insulin requirement and insulin resistance, we need to increase the basal rate gradually. And that's why we have all these extra steps. And how many steps do you have? It depends on how high you need to jump. If you're really going from 0.9 to 1.8, then you really need all of these steps in almost every hour, just inch up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit until you get to what you need and so forth. Um, this is an example of a patient who started on DIY loop with no settings optimization whatsoever. And as you can see, this just doesn't work. Uh, this is not working at all. I mean, nothing is working. It's just like 28% in target. That's it. That's all the time in green and the rest of the time it's high. And loop is working almost all day, continuously adjusting the basal up and down, up and down. And it's still not very effective uh, with a lot of boluses here. Patient is bolusing for the food. Uh, I don't know how they're doing with the carb counting, but clearly this is just not working. This is an argument for you know, we do need to adjust the settings, optimize the settings uh, ahead of time before we start looping or we start any closed loop system because eventually it might work, but I think we'll get a much better performance if we have the settings optimized and particularly the basal rate, but not to mention also the insulin to carb ratios and the ISF and the insulin duration time. All of those are going to become very more important. Um, However, where, where do we start? Uh, you know, this is uh, it's like, you know, take the age of the child, take the pubertal status, make a guess of what the basal rate should be. But there is a, an area that can be taken advantage of, which is right here. If I look carefully as right here, this is a, a blood sugar that sort of dropped down and then went steady for about an hour until she ate breakfast and then went up here. So here we have a, 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 a guess at a reasonable basal rate that was actually working for about an hour so before she, before she got the bolus. So we can look back here and then say, what was the basal rate that was actually delivered by the pump? And adding up all of these bits and pieces of basal that was delivered and, and spread it over this time, you know, considering that there were time with zero basal and then there were time with you know, 120% basal and say, what was this payload? It looks like it was a 0.6 or 0.65, and it looks like 0.6 was actually working just right for this hour here. Uh, so maybe the 0.6 at this time is okay. And if I think that the 0.6 is actually working right here, which is the morning peak, I can pretty much guess what it should be right here because this should be lower than the morning peak. And I can pretty much guess what it should be right here. It should be also lower, not as low as the 3 a.m. one, but perhaps a little bit you know, somewhere in between, and then I can, that gives me a much better informed guessing of what the basal rate should look like. And I can build that pattern and say, well, let's start here and see what happens. Review in two or three days and make some fine tuning adjustments. And Dr. D, I just want to let you know we're at 12.53. Oh, okay, great. So I am going to skip this one. Thank you, Jen. Mm -hmm. Um, this is uh, relatively small, uh, so I'm going to spend just three seconds on this and say this pattern here says insulin to carb ratio is not working. Every time he eats something, he just ends up higher and higher and higher. The other thing you notice that it's all 10, 30, 20, 20, 30, 15. End up with five and zeros. These are estimation of carbs, not carb counting and measuring and weighing, which is perfectly fine. I actually stopped asking people to wager and measure, but I would say, Let's do a better estimation of the carbs. I think this is just like every time you eat, you end up much higher still. You need to either make sure that you're estimating better or and or that you need more insulin for carbs as well. Uh, narrower target range. Okay, for those on closed loop systems, uh, and Jen, I, I, I know we're gonna probably end up about seven or eight minutes over time, uh, but stick with me. Um, 
the, this, is, this is DIY loop. And you can see again, the, the, the settings of the base are right here with the dashed line. And all of these changes just up and down, up and down, up and down. The system is modulating the basal either higher or lower, higher or lower, suspending and doubling, suspending and doubling all night. This can be a sign of the so-called narrow target range in loop. And that's the same for many other closed loop systems that we're going to see, which is you don't have a target number. You actually have a target range of numbers. You have a low and a high. And in this particular case, it was set at 100 and 100. So there was no range. It was just like 100. So if the blood sugar drops below 100, the software will do something. If a blood sugar rises above 100, it's going to do something. So it was constantly doing something versus setting a range that say it's 90 to 130, which is what I ended up doing, is 90 to 130. Anything in between 90 and 130, don't do anything about it. It's fine because otherwise we'll end up with just this madness right here. I have no idea what's working and what's not working. Clearly the system is effective and it's keeping it okay, but there is like, I don't know what the basal settings should be right here. Uh, and when we narrow the target range, we actually get a little bit, and this is still the, 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 the narrow target range. When we widen it, we adjusted the basal, we increased the insulin to carb ratio and widened the target range to 90 to 130. Uh, and guess what? Now, if I want you to just look at this and remember what it used to look like up and down, up and down, up and down. Now we got the settings just right and loop the software does not have to do much at all. It's actually for the entire night, it was running on the preset basal without having to make adjustments. And the blood sugars were nice and steady for the whole night. And in fact, for even for the daytime, it didn't do that much. So it was really just minimal intervention of DIY loop. The software wasn't having to do that much because we got the settings just right. And if we get the settings right, it's going to do minimal adjustments. And if with minimal adjustments, it's much more effective in maintaining the blood sugar in range, as opposed to having to either double or, or zero the basal rate all day long. And I just, you know, and, and, and getting much less variability, glucose variability. Again, our target right now is less than 30% glucose uh, variability or coefficient of variation, which is the indicator for glucose variability. Uh, and this is just to show that it's not just a fluke one day, this is day after day after day, we're getting the same kind of thing, which is minimal intervention. Just focus on this time right here and the rest of the day. No intervention in loop. The basal rate is working just right. And again, the same thing. Uh, we start seeing a morning trend again. Um, this is just three weeks later. You remember it used to be flat line like this. Now she's starting puberty and starting to actually go up. Just to point out that whatever works today doesn't mean that it's gonna work three weeks from now in children again. And here it is again now, it's just a week later. And yes, it's maintaining it nice and steady, but now loop is going back to making adjustments. Here. What if it's making adjustments and increasing the basal every night like this? You say, why don't I increase the basal rate and just make sure that it's going to work okay? And even for insulin to carb ratio here, it seems like in the afternoon it's not working or maybe her counting is not accurate here. And that's why she ended up high. So we have a conversation about that. So main settings, uh, basal insulin, insulin to carb ratio, ISF. And so we talked about basal insulin. Let's spend just a couple of minutes, a couple of slides on the insulin to carb ratio. Um, evaluating insulin to carb ratio. Uh, here's one example of 41 grams duca bolus for it, and it worked beautifully. So that's a good insulin to carb ratio that works really well. So you end up, you start out here, includes a little correction in the background of a basal that's working as it's scheduled. There's no adjustment in basal and there is no decrease in basal. There's no other activity that's going on. We evaluate the insulin to carb ratio for the 41 gram here and it worked very, very well. We come back to this 16 grams and we see that, well, that yes, it ended up being a little bit higher and loop software had to increase the basal rate a little bit. So this bolus wasn't enough. Maybe we should do a little bit more insulin for carbs for here. And we'll see the same thing here. There was actually a much higher blood sugar here right after these meals. Perhaps we need to increase the insulin to carb ratio. And that's kind of what we did. 
So basal rates are okay. Breakfast insulin to carb ratio is okay, but needs more insulin for carbs for later, for the rest of the day. The breakfast is fine. The rest of the day needs a little bit more. Another opportunity for, to talk about here is the pre bolusing I put that here to remind me. This here, if you actually look at it very carefully, and I'm gonna blow this up a little bit for you. So here's the 41 grams, and here's the bolus for it. But this person, this mom actually did very well in pre bolusing before she ate, because look when she actually started rising her blood sugar after eating breakfast. Yeah, she started rising at, she bolused at 7.46 a.m. and the blood sugar started rising at 8.14 a.m. This was almost 30 minutes in between. So clearly this was a pre bolus by about 15 to 20 minutes and it worked really well. There was no post-breakfast spike and it ended up just staying in green and coming down right here. Again, showing this picture to the mom and the kid and showing you say, give them positive reinforcement of how well it worked and how well they did and the visual impact of how well all of this, you know, you can see it as opposed to trying to explain sort of theoretically what would happen or what might happen if you bowl us before, or if you bowl us after, instead of imagining all of that, just it's, it's right there. It actually did happen. Look at it and you can see it and it, it works much better. Um, again, evaluating insulin to carb ratio. Uh, I think we're probably either going to skip this or, you know, oh no, this is, you know, sometimes you don't actually have a single meal that you need to look at. You have a collection. Collectively, you have three different meals right here within two hours, but collectively for the next four hours, there was nothing else. And collectively, they all worked okay and came down to about a hundred. Uh, so clearly, whatever it is, the insulin to carb ratio here is working just fine and clearly is working just fine here for the rest of the day. So now that we have, you know, corrected the insulin to carb ratio and adjusted the basal rates and they're working just, just okay, uh, we can say that these settings are much better than before. All right. um, again, just another example of just a quick look and we can see that the morning breakfast ratio is actually working okay, but the afternoon ratio is not working. The rest of the day uh, on you know, all of this is going up. Despite control IQ, this is a, T, a patient on a T-slim control IQ, despite control IQ increasing the basal right after the, this meal and right after this meal and right after this meal. So every single meal is ending up higher, even with a higher basal rate delivery it's still not coming down to where it needs to be because he's eating now four hours later or three hours later. Uh, so clearly this is suggesting that the insulin to carb ratio is not enough. And if I hover over this in real time, this is what it's going to show me. It's going to say blood sugar was 87. So that means there was no correction for the blood sugar and the carbs were 71 and the delivered bolus was 7.62 based on a carb ratio of one to nine and based on an ISF of 85 and a target of 110. So one to nine wasn't enough. Uh, so what should we make it? Should we make it one for eight? Should we make it one for seven? And instead of guessing, what I actually would do is go and calculate and say, how much was this bolus and how much extra insulin did it have to give you because it looks like at this meal, and this is the, the, the day before that we just saw on the previous slide, on, for this meal here, it's not showing. Oh, there it is. For this meal here, the blood sugar stayed the same. You, see, you, end, you start out here and you end up here. So that means this coverage for this meal worked out just well, but how much insulin did it require to keep this rest steady? What it required is this bolus and this basal together. So I add this up and I add this up and I divide 38 grams by this and we actually end up with a one to seven instead of one to eight. So instead of guessing when, what, should, what the carb ratio should be, we find opportunities to calculate by doing something like this and we end up actually one to seven. So I'm gonna go through this animation one more time and it's pretty slow. Sorry about that. All right, so main settings. Again, we talked about basal rate. We talked about the insulin to carb ratio. What about ISF uh, and insulin duration time? Because I think that can be something and I promise I'll be done in just two minutes. 
so here's, here's the example that we want to look for, which is nighttime. We want to look for a pure correction bolus or a clean correction bolus that there's no food, no exercise, and there's no better time than to do this at four in the morning or five in the morning when the child is sleeping. There was a bolus to correct the high blood sugar and there was an increase in the basal by the, by the closed loop system. I'm sorry again, I'm clicking too many times. Um, that this led to eventually a drop in blood sugar from here to here and back down into the green zone about three hours later. And then it went steady right here. So it, this, this and this effectively dropped the blood sugar here and then it went steady after that. So if I calculate, all right, what was the basal rate here? The set basal was, uh, let's say it was 0.2 unit an hour. This was running at almost two units an hour for how long? So how much extra insulin did it give? I can pretty much guess what that is or calculate. You know, I don't have to have a, a calculator and a pencil, but I can you know, have a good estimate of how much extra basal did it give right here and add it to this bolus right here and say together, this 1.1 unit decreased your blood sugar from this point to this point. So how much is one unit will do? That's your ISF. And here's the other thing. It started out here and it ended up here and now the blood sugar is steady. That means no more effect. So how long did that take? From here to here, it's almost exactly three hours. And that's how you can calculate the insulin duration time. When you go from a steady line to a decrease with a bolus until you get a new steady line. That's the time that basically indicates the effective, practical uh, insulin duration time. Of course, there's going to be another long tail here that goes on for another two or three hours. It depends on the dose that you give, uh, but is it really gonna matter that much? I think effectively, we kind of just calculate from here to here and say that's your insulin duration time. Uh, here's another one that is similar, but it's a little bit better because there was no bolus here. And again, this is 9 p.m. There's no more food. It's been four hours since the last dose, since the last meal. Patient is sleeping. Blood sugar is here. There's no bolus because it was still in green. But Loop actually decided to increase the basal here for about 20 minutes and calculated that I need to give you this much insulin and that was it. There was nothing else. It's still running at the basal rate. It was just a tiny little adjustment here that we're going to ignore. But we can calculate how much extra insulin was given here, calculate the difference from the high blood sugar, where did it go, and then we went run flat here. And you say, well, that's your insulin, uh, that's your ISF ratio. And if we go through the calculation, which I won't bore you with, uh, but basically uh, the temp basal was running at 2.4 unit an hour. The schedule was 0.6 unit an hour. And so the extra basal that was given, instead of 0.6, it gave 2.4. So extra is 1.8 unit per hour. But it wasn't a full hour, it was only a 20 minutes. So instead of 1.8, it was actually a third of that, which is 0.6. So effectively, this extra, ball, this extra basal right here gave an extra 0.6 units total. And that 0.6 units, drop the blood sugar from 160 to 86. So that means 0.6 drops you 74, one unit drops you 104. Roughly your ISF is between 100 to 110. Instead of guessing what the ISF is, I think we can come up with, we can find opportunities within the CGM data to actually take a look and say, let's do a, a, an informed calculation and figure out what your ISF is, what your ICR is, and then what your basal rate is. What do you think of this basal rate? This is a very good basal rate. Unfortunately, there are no boluses. This patient just is not bolusing. So he's staying at 300 the whole time, staying at 400 the whole time. So the basal works just fine over the whole night. Look at this, this is nice and steady, but I wish we were down here in the green. And all it needs is just a bolus to correct the blood sugar before bedtime. So this is an opportunity to talk about this, but this is not about basal rate or insulin to carb ratio. This is about, Let's do one thing for me, please. 
take a correction bolus before going to sleep. Because if you do, your basal rate is going to maintain you nice and steady for the whole night and you win the night. Whatever happens during the day, at least we win that night being in green instead of being in purple the whole day. 0% green, unfortunately. All right, summary. With CGM data, we don't really need to do basal testing. I think we can actually find those opportunities to calculate the insulin to carb ratio and the ISF. Review of detailed daily views can be full of actionable information, not just the big picture and the aggregate of all, but look at each and every day and look for those opportunities. Focus on the nighttime basal. It will inform the daytime basal, so that way you don't have to do basal testing. And then even with automated insulin delivery, closed loop systems, we still need to review and optimize our settings because I think that the closed loop system will perform better if we have optimized settings and make the actual basal delivery in closed loops uh, work for you so that you don't have to guess what the basal rate should be. It can be informed with what the system did and how much it actually delivered. That's a good way to do it. And then don't forget the patterns. Again, I love those patterns because they are really helpful. And I hope that I have convinced you that interpreting diabetes data is fun because I love numbers, I love data, and I love math. Uh, that's why I like and enjoy doing this and fine tuning things. And it's really more science than art. I think, you know, it's more art than science. That was back 20, 25 years ago before CGM data. Now that we have data, we have, we can see it. It's no longer an art. Uh, it, it really is a science. And finally, I'm going to list my email here. This is my personal email. And I invite anyone who has any questions uh, to follow up or comments or feedback or suggestions, you know, whatever it is, to email me back uh, and I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Wow, Dr. D, I have a whole entire notebook here <laughs> filled <laughs> with information. So thank you so much. That was so informative. I'm sure we have a lot of questions here. Um, so uh, go ahead and put them in the chat or if you wanna um, ask your question live, we can do that as well. You can put your, uh, your name in the chat or just say that you wanna ask your question live and we can get to that. I'm gonna just start with a couple questions that came through. Where did my chat just go? I'm so sorry, it disappeared on me. Um, so one, one uh, question came in from Elizabeth about how she always has the fear of taking too much insulin and how would you address this? Uh, just making sure that you don't have too much insulin on board. Um, you, you know, when, when it comes to making adjustments, you know, whatever you calculate that you need, you need more of, you don't have to make that big jump and you can just go in steps. So let's say, for example, I gave you the, the latest example or recent example of how the 149 uh, for carbs wasn't enough and we had to go to 127. Uh, but you don't have to jump to one to seven. You can try one for eight. That's fine uh, if you're worried about it. You can try even 8.5. Give it a week and then say, okay, let's try eight. Then let's try 7.5. Then it's not working. We have room. Let's go safely 2.147. That is perfectly fine to do. Uh, there's no rush to fix everything all at once. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see here. Um... Uh, so, uh, Dan, I think you may also have some questions. Uh, there is a question about where we can download this presentation. I'll be sending out an email to everyone after this, uh, this call with a, with a link to the recording. We usually have them out on YouTube. So the, all this information, all those slides, um, there's a lot of data there will be made available. And Dan, if you do want to ask any of your questions live, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and pop on the screen if you want. Um, and while we wait, let me see here. Uh, I'm so sorry, my chat keeps uh, jumping up to the top. So well, just, just uh, Jen, to assure pe people, you know, um, I, I'm I'm happy to stay on. You know, we can we can certainly do another 20 to 30 minutes or so. I I can't believe you put your email up there. You are one brave doctor. <laughs> So uh, let's see, does anyone have any questions? I, we see a ton of thank yous in the chat. Uh, um, let's see. Michelle, I think you had a question regarding pre-bolusing and um, he did, uh, Dr. D kind of mentioned that um, in order to get the, how, how to avoid getting a spike after eating. 
Yeah, so pre-bolusing pre is essential, uh, especially you know, no matter how fast your insulin is, even if you're using FIASP, it's still not fast enough, and particularly for breakfast. You know, for, and, and you know, if you eat avocado and bacon and an egg for breakfast, you may not need, but I would say actually even then, you still need to do the pre-bolusing because, because digestion and absorption of food at breakfast time is much faster than the rest of the, time, rest of the day even if you eat the same food, it's just, you know, we're just ready to uh, digest and absorb in the morning. So pre-bolusing for breakfast is really essential. And I would definitely advise for starting with 15 minutes, that's a safe one. Uh, and then keep an eye on your CGM tracing. If, if it starts dropping too low, then you say, just take a bite of something. It doesn't have to be anything, just one little bite. You don't have to eat the whole breakfast and it kicks it right back up. And then it really works very well for preventing the post breakfast spike. For the rest of the day, for the other meal, this kind of you just have to try and see. Uh, but you know, five to 10 minutes before lunch, definitely. Dinner typically does not require that. Uh, if you're going to bolus, maybe either doing an extended bolus or, or, or just before eating, or maybe even just after eating. It depends on what you're eating and how heavy it is. Um, all right. So let's see here. So uh, we have uh, Michelle who recently switched to a plant-based whole diet, which many, uh, which, and it has many low blood sugars after eating and then goes higher later. And how long would you extend the insulin delivery for a plant-based whole diet? That's a, that's a great question and a great example of actually, I didn't have, I had an example of that, but I didn't have time to go for, you know, over it. But basically looking at the CGM tracing and say, you, you can see when the blood sugars start to rise, how many hours after finishing the meal. You can see that if you have a low blood sugar first, you treat it and it goes up. And then suddenly three or four hours later, it starts to go up again. And you will notice that consistently. And that really tells you when are you really digesting that food that you're eating. Uh, and keep notes of what you ate and how long did it take. And if you go back and you say, okay, it, you know, my blood sugar is rising four hours after I, I eat. That means you probably shouldn't bolus until after you finish eating and then extend the bolus for three to four hours. And experiment, just do all kinds of experiments, you know, 30% uh, yeah, now, 70% extended for three hours, see how that works and change those parameters. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I see we have a doctor here. Lee, Lee Tinker raised her hand. If you have a question, just okay, unmute yourself. Let's see. Yeah. Oh yeah, Lee Tinker, do you want to, I can unmute you? Lee, do you have a question? Um, try this one more time. I'm unable to unmute, so. Oh, there, Lee, are you there? Yes. Good. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Yeah, hi, we can hear you. Yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, describe how to follow the CGM patterns for somebody with some delayed gastric emptying and, you know, recommendations on uh, bolusing for that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think to piggyback on the previous question, which is, you know, for heavy meals, it's really about looking back and, and timing. You kind of have to just, you know, take a notebook out and say, okay, I ate this, uh, this particular food and I ate at this time and finished eating at that time. And then go back the next day and say, okay, I'm gonna look at the CGM data and see when did my blood sugar start to rise? Because clearly if you take your bolus uh, right at, at the dinner time, for example, uh, it's going to cause a low blood sugar first because of the delayed emptying. And then several hours later, the blood sugar will start to rise. So make a note and say, when does it start to rise and how long does it take to actually reach the peak? And that really gives you an idea of when are you really digesting that food and absorbing it. And that gives you an idea of not only when do you have to bolus for that meal, but also how long to extend it. 
And it takes a lot of experimentation back and forth and doing, you know, percent now and percent later. Uh, and, and especially if you don't have a closed loop system, this is actually kind of a, uh, it's, it's a homework, it's a project that it may take actually several weeks of making notes and experimenting. And, and if you can talk to your, you know, your diabetes provider to help you with it, I think it would be great, but it can certainly be worked out. Thank you. There's a, a question in the chat from Dan Heller. Yes. And do really low blood sugars somehow cause the stomach to slow down the absorption of oral sugars? Um, I would actually, I would, I would think the answer is the opposite. I think that, you know, when you're low, it actually, your body is ready to absorb, especially simple carbs. So if you take some juice of carbohydrates uh, or glucose tablets, you absorb that much quicker. Uh, I think the example that you said, you know, that sometimes when BGs are low, it's hard to raise them. That may be true in, at nighttime because there's definitely a, a difference in the rate of absorption, even for simple carbs, even for juice. If you're, if you're drinking juice and swallowing it in the middle of the night uh, versus uh, the daytime, uh, in the middle of the night at 2 or 3 a.m., it's much harder to raise the blood sugar. It's, I shouldn't say much harder. It's actually much slower to raise the blood sugar. Even if you drink juice, it just takes a little bit longer to do that. And that's why I see, you know, you find yourself oftentimes just treating and retreating and retreating at 2 in the morning before it finally starts to go up. And then three hours later, it's just like shooting way up now that you're waking up and absorbing everything that you drank. Uh, so that's something that to keep in mind. And you can actually look back at the data again and see that that phenomenon is happening uh, and, and how quickly the blood sugar is rising. And if you recall, uh, there was one example when we showed that the, uh, you know, how to calculate the, the low treatment index thing and say, okay, I took one glucose tablet and then the blood sugar rose within 15 minutes by 100 points. Uh, that, that same person actually had another example of, of drinking the same or eating the same thing, one glucose tablet, but it was at one in the morning. And the, instead of rising very quickly, it actually took much longer to rise. Uh, so it's definitely much slower to do it at night because our bodies are not ready to do anything. They're sleeping versus if you treat somebody at, for a low at five or six in the morning or even during the daytime. So uh, we have a question on how do you prevent a rebound from a low, even without over-treating the low? Uh, if, if you're still having a rebound without over-treating, then I think that there's not much you can do, unfortunately, it's just going to happen. You have the capacity that your body is, is producing sugar and is responding to the low blood sugar. And uh, that's a good thing. Uh, it's just that it's, it's good to know that that's happening and rely on it so that you don't have to um, increase the, I mean, I mean take too much carbs uh, and just keep it from rebounding too much. Do you want to ask a question? Um, you're uh, on mute. Ja Jack. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Jack has a question. Um, and I, Molly's dad. I know you're Molly's dad. I just hear a mute if you want to ask a question. Hey, I did, but I didn't put anything in chat. But um, so I have three questions. Dr. D, you can respond to any of them. The first of the the first two are in regards to DIY closed loop. Um, one is um, insulin duration default is set to just over five hours. Yeah. Um, we've set it short. What's the appropriate, you know, sort of rate uh, for DIY loop. We're on basal and bolus. I know several people are on basal only. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a recommendation or preference? And the third is in regards to treating lows. Um, is there, um, you know, at times when she's skipping sort of in that, you know, 75, 70, 68, 71, um, I choose not to treat. Um, you know, when she's just sort of skipping right along at 70, um, is that the right decision? Yeah, uh, I'll start with the last question. And, and my answer is, 
Yeah, sure. You know, there's nothing wrong with a blood sugar of 66 and 68. Uh, granted that, you know, what's reading 68 may in fact be 62, 63, you know, they're not, you know, 100% accurate, the CGM readings. But I think when we get to that range, I think that's pretty good. And especially if you have a flat line and just let it, just let it go up to 70 and 71, I think that's, that's perfectly fine. So uh, if you feel comfortable with that, then by all means, I don't think that's the wrong thing to do. As far as the insulin duration time for DIY loop, I know that it's set at five hours, but I personally think that five hours is too long uh, and it's might actually preventing or messing up with some dosing. Uh, but I don't think it's that much of a deal yet. Uh, I think that if you have a chance to reduce the insulin duration time in DIY loop to three or four hours instead of five, I would do that. But if not, I think it's probably okay it's because it's really calculating the insulin on board as a long tail and what's left over after three or four hours. My understanding, again, I'm not the expert on DIY loop software and how it works, but my understanding is that it's, it's probably okay. Um, Steve, I think you have a question on control IQ. If you want to unmute. Hold. There I am. There so you go. There is a unique challenge with control IQ with regard to pre-bolusing, where it's compensating for the drop aggressively on pre, at pre meal. Is there any way to manage that so that it can be less aggressive at those times, either with Yeah, um, no, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't figured out how to do that. I know there, there's probably something to do. And then the first thought that occurred to me a, a few weeks ago, which is to, to tinker with the ISF. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you change the ISF, you're going to make it, um, uh, you, you know, you know, so, so just to explain, you know, if you, um, uh, Maybe you can explain it better, like, you know, the, the real Well, world. one of the things example. with the ISF that I hit on the mark, which I didn't understand in uh, uh, with the control IQ was I was having nighttime lows consistently, but I thought the basal was right. And so what was happening was it was getting too aggressive at night with the, the factor and I had the with factor the set wrong. I changed right. the factor, it all disappeared. I flatlined for, right. with the basal. Right. And I didn't realize that was going to have that big an impact. And so certainly my basils are a lot less now than before with, uh, um, with the control IQ because of the trying to offset the corrections that were going on, ran into a few issues. So that morning one is always a challenge because you're, you're battling, you know, the, 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 the rise in blood sugar plus the timing and, and then here the pump kicks in. And one of the things I thought of just shutting off control IQ to eat breakfast, because that seems to be the most common yeah. time that that occurs. Yeah. yeah. So when, when you're pre-bolus, uh, your blood sugar starts to drop in the first you know, 10 minutes or so. And as it starts to drop, you, you know, control IQ will just shut off the basal basically. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you end up with no basal for 15 minutes before you start eating the blood yeah. sugar rising. So um, one way is to maybe not do it you know, too far in advance uh, mm -hmm. or uh, to eat a bite of something. Yeah, that just, seems just to be the bite. best way to handle it. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's real easy to just say, even, even, even before you brush your teeth, just take a bite of a fruit mm -hmm. or something, you know, just, you know, two, three, four grams, depends on the age of that child, yeah. and say, okay, just, just eat this and then go do your thing and do your hair and come back and this. Smarties evening. have done the trick sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so and, anything. But I, I, would, I, I would hate to make it a habit of just eating things that are nat yeah. unnatural. And it's just, yeah. just not the way we do it. But unfortunately, there are certain things that we just have to do. Um, the same thing for, uh, for, um, for, for if you don't pre-bolus, then the blood sugar starts to rise very quickly. And then it compensates for increasing the basal at the same time. Uh, yeah. Yet there is a bolus coming and you end up actually being on the low side sometimes, or it ends up shutting off the basal later on. Uh, so unfortunately, again, the, the softwares are just, you know, working as well as they can for now, but they're not smart enough yet. I think those are areas. Yeah, I wish it's on the seesaw, it would just stay in the seat instead of running back and forth. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Dr. D, we have a question from Sarah who says, as a woman, I feel that my basal needs 
needs vary a few times a month and are not consistent each month. Any guidance on figuring this out? Uh, oh boy, I won't ask you how old you are, but uh, there's <laughs> definitely a, a pattern for, uh, for the menstrual cycle that definitely affects your basal rate as well as your sensitivity to insulin. And that is very variable from one person to a person. So there's no like one set rule for everyone. Most uh, females will actually have an increased insulin resistance. So they need more insulin two days before the period starts and about two to three days into it. Not for the whole time when you have your period, uh, but the first three days but it starts two days before. So you kind of have to anticipate it and keep track of the calendar and, and, and have a setting that's for the, the period that's gonna give you 30, 40, even 50% more basal during, that, during those five days. Uh, now, most times that's it, that's all you need to do, but there are a lot of women who also have the opposite happen, which is an increased insulin sensitivity right around the ovulation time. So it's not during the cycle itself, the, the, the menstruation itself, it's during the ovulation time in the middle of the cycle. So day 13, 14, and 15. So again, keeping track of the calendar and noting, going back to the data and noticing what's happening. And if you're using Tidepool, you can, you can do your post-it notes you just on your iPhone. You can just grab the app and quickly and say, my period started now. And then you can go back and actually look at all of those things and, and try to make sense of them. Um, thanks, Dr. D. We have a question from Raj. After my daughter eats a meal, she walks her bikes for 20 to 30 minutes. Just some light exercise to prevent a blood sugar spike after the meal. Is this a good practice? Do you have any other suggestions for how to prevent a blood sugar spike after meals? Thank you for your help. Yes, this is um, not, not a bad idea, but unfortunately, I think it may have some side effects, which is here, here's the general principle. Um, if you eat a meal and you go out and do any type of exercise, whether it's walking, biking, running, or whatever it is, even shopping, uh, the, basically the body knows that your muscles are working. So it shifts all the blood supply and oxygen to your muscles. And it takes away all the blood supply and the energy from your stomach, from your GI system. Because the GI system is no longer essential at that moment. Your muscles are asking for it. The body doesn't know. The brain doesn't know what you're doing. Your muscles are working. That means you must be running away from something that's essential. Okay, this is a survival thing. So it shifts everything. All your blood supply goes to your skeletal muscles that are working during the exercise. And your GI system is no longer working. It actually shuts down the digestion of food. So you're basically delaying the absorption of the food. And that's why it, it works for uh, preventing the, the spike in the blood sugar because you're shutting off the digestion of the food. But then you're gonna end up either too low or if you end up okay, you're gonna end up with high blood sugars later. So this is a classic example that you will see in children who eat lunch at school and then go out and have a recess and, and run around and crazy. Uh, they eat the lunch, they take the bolus, they all have a low blood sugar after exercise and they all have a high blood sugar at three in the afternoon when they go home uh, because it's the, it's, it's the opposite of what it should be. You should exercise first, have your recess, then go in and eat your lunch and take your, breakfast, take your bolus for it. If you do it the opposite, then you're just delaying the absorption. And if that's the case, what we used to do is actually do an extended bolus for lunch uh, or even delay the bolus altogether until recess is finished completely. You know, you eat your lunch, you go out and pray, come back, now take your bolus uh, because that's when you're gonna start digesting the food. Very interesting. Um, all right, we have a question from Sarah. Is the dawn phenomenon a result of the changing basal rates in the morning or is it tied to adrenaline re release from getting ready for the day? So this uh, is the it's, spike. It's, yeah, it's a good question. And uh, the, no, the, the basal rate is actually following the insulin resistance. And the insulin resistance is developing gradually overnight from let's say one or 2 a.m until 6 or 7 a.m. It's, it's, it's developing because of increased release of cortisol, not adrenaline. The cortisol and the testosterone are the, one, are the two hormones that get secreted in the highest level during the morning hours as we wake up. And those two hormones cause insulin resistance. That's why you need more basal. And that's why you also need more insulin for the carbs for breakfast because you're more resistant in general. 
uh, and, and, and you need higher insulin to carb ratio. Uh, so, and, and because that cortisol level is rising gradually, that's why you need to gradually increase the basal rate. There's no particular set point when you say, okay, I'm gonna raise my, secrete my cortisol at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. No, it, it's a gradual increase over the night. All right, we have a question from Dan. Can you briefly mention the athlete's paradox where zone two and zone three exercise cause muscles to absorb sugars without the use of insulin? I exercise a lot and it affects my nighttime BGs to the point where I'm entirely without basal between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. when the dawn effect begins. Uh, <laughs> Dan, you just explained it better than I have uh, or better than I can. Uh, I think that's absolutely correct that uh, there is something called independent absorption of glucose. Uh, so uh, you can certainly get that glucose into the muscle cells without any insulin if you exercise. The more you exercise, the, more, the, the better this works and the more sensitive you become also. So even without any insulin, you can get that glucose in and lower the blood sugar and continue metabolism. And, and the, also the other part, which is fine, if that's what you need, you exercise a lot, and especially in the evening time or afternoon, then it's going to affect you for several hours after that into the night. And if, if, and if, you, if what you need is zero insulin delivery, that is perfectly fine because you are utilizing glucose. The important thing is to every once in a while, you know, to check your ketones after having, you know, four hours of no basal insulin, just to make sure that you're still having no ketones. And I predict that you won't, but if you do, then maybe what you need to do is take a little extra insulin because you need to eat something extra and make sure that you're getting some insulin. But if you don't have any ketones, that's perfectly fine. It's a good strategy. The other part of what you said, which is, which is true and interesting, is that the effect of the evening exercise can last for several hours, but it only lasts up until about 3 a.m. And after 3 a.m., that nadir, that valley that we talked about between 1 and 3 a.m., because you're very sensitive to insulin, once you pass that period of time, 3 to 4 a.m., you are no longer having an effect from the evening exercise the night before. Now you need to get back to just having a normal basal. Uh, so for those who exercise in the evening and have to lower the basal, not completely shut it off, but let's say you want to run at 50% basal for four hours, five hours, you should probably do it up until all the way till 3 a.m. But after 3 a.m., you should kick back to normal basal. All right. Um, we got a lot of thank yous again. Um, and are there any other questions that you guys have for Dr. D? Again, my email is out there now, uh, and anyone who can think of a question, I'm happy to answer it individually. Well, we can't thank you enough for taking so much time out of your day, Dr. D. And I also want to do another big thank you to Bethany, our uh, sponsor of GVOC, and what a great um, uh, to be on the forefront of knowing that there is now this uh, glucagon syringe that's available for us. So thank you, Bethany, for sharing that with us in advance of tomorrow's big release. And thank you guys all for joining us today. We're so excited to have you guys here. And another big thank you to Dr. Adik. So um, we will we'll be uh, sending out a follow-up email with this recording. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys at our next virtual event. Hope you guys all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, and thank you everyone else for all your questions and sticking around. Uh, I hope you will uh, like data and numbers as much as I do. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. D. All right. All right, bye everyone.